dare great things for Christ. Christ calls us to dare great things. In the marketplace, as well as in the mission field, there has never been a time like the present for the spirit of the Catholic entrepreneur. Now is the time for men and women of great courage and great vision to engage our church and our culture. Now is the time to dare great things. And here is your host as we dare great things, Father Nathan Cromley, the president and founder of the St. John Institute. Daring great things is where leadership begins, but leadership ends in the hearts of those who follow us. It's not enough just to be doing things or to be doing them well. We have to do them in a way that other people can associate with and make it their own. How do I make my great accomplishments a legacy that other people can benefit from? We have to learn how to make our spirit come alive in the hearts of others. Ironically, a leader has to be concerned about his followers. I'm really excited to be able to work with leaders. I'm really excited to be able to work with you guys because you're taking a step forward where few people choose to go. And because you do that, it's almost like St. Peter getting out of the boat. You encounter risk. The easiest thing to do to avoid risk is to simply keep from trying. But as soon as you try to go from where you are now to the next point and, and try to break new ground, or stretch things just a little bit further. As soon as you try to do things well in any circumstance in your life, you encounter the lethargy and the weight of people around you who have determined that they do not want to try because the risk is too great, the pain is not worth the reward, the view is not worth the climb in their estimation. Even Aristotle talking about virtue and learning to live in virtue, he even says the same thing. He says that few are they who really are willing to make the arduous effort to acquire virtue. Most people, he says, simply remain in their sensations. And by that, he means that most people don't ask questions. Most people don't go beyond what they experience in an easy way. Most people go after what is pleasant and easy instead of what is rewarding but hard. But that's just it. You are not most people. You are those who are choosing to strive for great things, to dare the heights. And that's why we're behind you. That's why we started the St. John Leadership Network. That's why we're doing this class, okay? Because I want you to succeed. When you do that, when you push forward, when you try, you actually awaken a spiritual aspect to yourself, a deep down harmony with God. And that spiritual point becomes also a place where you can receive his grace, and where you can go deeper in your holiness. I really think that if we can bring leadership to faith and faith to leadership, we'll create great saints who dare great things in our world. And I'm happy to think that you're in their number. So we're looking right now today at why we fail. And I love to look at this, even though it's kind of depressing, of course, <laughs> but it's very, it gives us a lot of light. Sometimes if you start by the negative, you, the positive shines out all the more brightly, right? There's, there's nothing, it's an old preaching trick that if you want your crowd to pay attention, you start to talk about the devil. It's so, it's so ridiculous. You can talk about the Beatitudes, about love, about virtue all day long. No one will pay attention. But as soon as you start saying that we're being attacked and that the devil's around the corner, etc., boy, everybody sits up in their seat. And that's, and that's kind of natural because we all take for granted the good things and we, we are striving to not fail. We don't want the good things that we have to be taken away. And so we're very attentive, even more attentive, to how we can fail sometimes than how we can succeed. So how do we fail? Let's go ahead. And, <laughs> let's look at that, right? And, and Well, one way to fail that we often neglect is we don't bring our followers with us. Right? From, a, from a, the point of view of the leadership network that we started here, we call that feeling forlorn. Forlorn. It's an old-fashioned word, but basically it means feeling lonely, feeling as if you've been rejected, feeling as though you have no uh, ability to win anyone over. It's almost the opposite of the attitude of a salesperson. A salesperson is great 
because they go forward with the, the attitude that this person that they're encountering actually wants and needs to follow them. And so they're great. We just love meeting them because we, when you meet someone who's gotten sales, there they are and they're just happy to meet you and they're, <laughs> they're moving in a direction constantly to bring you along with them. And we all know how much that's a mental game so often for them to stay on the top of their game because doors get slammed in their faces. People say no all the time. I remember I used to try to sell newspapers back in my hometown and, and we would be selling these newspapers cold calls on the phone. And what they did is they literally just put the, the area code, then the, the little regional number, and then they, you would have 0001 or 0002 or 0003. And you would go just like that, calling these poor people on the phone and asking them if they wanted uh, you know, to, to get a newspaper. And it, what was amazing, it was so hard to do because you're calling them out of the blue and you're trying to get them to do something that they neither thought of nor really wanted to do in the first place. And I remember when they were interviewing for this position and, and, you know, and doing their onboarding into the position, they were asking all kinds of questions about how you deal with rejection and what your reaction is towards the people who, who will actually be angry at you, right? Can you keep your cool? They were looking for people with a special skill set and it's the skill set that a lot of sales positions depend on. It's a skill set of confidence and the ability to bring people behind you. Now, we all know this can be done for the wrong, right? Like I think a lot of bad leaders in the history of the world probably had this same kind of charismatic charm to bring people behind them, but to do it in the wrong way. But if you can do it in the right way, I mean, you almost need to be able to do it in the right way, right? When, you, when our Lord sends forth the apostles two by two, for example, in order to go and heal the sick and cure, cast out demons, etc., he gives them instructions, but then he, he sends them into a situation which is extremely difficult. You know what I'm talking about. He says, you know, take neither, you know, traveling bag nor, nor walking stick, you know, go this way, go th and, and do all of these things. Well, he's developing in them their ability to go towards people and relate with them as a leader, as someone who is making an impact and an influence in their life in order to change it for the better. And that, that requires a skill. So how many people do we know that have a hard time with us priests? And I'm just going to, you know, <laughs> I'm just going to say, you know, listen, being a priest is really hard. You try it sometime. You know, sometimes people complain about my homilies and I just kind of smile. And I'm like, well, you can go ahead and try, you know, go, <laughs> let's see how you do. <laughs> it's, it's not the easiest speaking venue in the world, you know? And, and yet one, one thing that comes back a lot of time about us priests is people say they act like they don't care. They don't smile. They're not, it's almost like a doctor at the bedside, their bedside manner with the patients. We all know it's hard to be a doctor, just like we know it's hard to be a priest. But part of what is essential to your job is how people relate to you. Do you know that 70% of what determines whether or not a patient does well in a counseling relationship. So if you go to a, a psychological counselor, marriage counselor, school counselor, anyone who's trying to help you with counseling, 70% of what determines if that relationship does well or not is the relationship of trust and the bond that the two have. If there's a friendly relationship between the two, that relationship will, that's 70% of what determines its success, right? So this is a key aspect for us as we are in our positions, it's whether or not our people are willing to follow us. We're willing to lead. We're willing to do. We're willing to push. But is anyone behind us? Is anyone actually following? Right? It is, we, can, we can push all we want, but we'll be pushing against a brick wall if in fact the people who are behind us don't believe in us. So what's the secret? How, how do I do this well? How do I both dare something great and bring people with me? Well, herein lies the secret of what Christ brings us when he brings us the ability to form true communion. Would you like to hear more from Father Nathan? Join the St. John Leadership Network and receive a two-minute glance at the gospel every Sunday morning right to your phone. To learn more, go to www.stjohnleadershipnetwork.org slash member and join for free today. I remember one time I was talking with a, a business guy when I was just starting off my ministry 
And the fellow was giving me advice. And, and he said, what are you trying to do? And I said, I'm trying to do leadership training. And he said, well, you know what leadership is, don't you? And I said, no, how do I know if I'm a leader? And he said, you'll know if you're a leader if you look over your shoulder and you see people following behind you. And I thought, you know, obviously that's a bit simplistic on that situation. But then again, I, I, you know, it's an essential aspect. And the more I think about it, the more I think he really put his finger on something essential there. I can do all kinds of things and have all kinds of visions. But if folks aren't behind me, then I'm not really leading. You know, Gallup, the, the famous poll agency, they took a poll on leadership. And they did, what is the, what are the four main qualities of a leader, according to Gallup? So they went around, they asked everyone in the country, you know, how, what do you think of this? You know, and the top four qualities that came up were vision, whether or not their people trusted them, whether or not they trusted their people, and passion. Those are the top four. Now, what's interesting about those top four is two of them are about the, the, the leader's ability to push forward, vision and passion. I want this and I really want it with all my heart. And, but half of it, the other half, was the relationship of the follower to the leader. Now, that, that's amazing because that means over half of what we're doing as a leader ought to be concerned with the relationship between us and our followers. It kind of reminds me of, of that, that time a parent came to me and was saying, you know, their kids are not listening to them. They're telling them all about the truth. And the kids are just keep going further and further away from God. The more that we tell them about God, the further they seem to run. And, and I told them, listen, remember this saying, love is the bridge truth walks across. All right? If I have to communicate truth, I have something that I need to tell you. I am a leader and I need to say it to you, right? Because I have either a product I need to sell you, a service I need to provide for you. A, it's like a teacher trying to teach somebody, right? We, we all know this. Think about your, your most effective teachers. They weren't necessarily the smartest of people. There may have been more intelligent people who knew the subject better. The art of teaching is in the relationship between the teacher and the students. A good teacher has the ability to build a bridge that truth walks across, to make a relationship that is both trusting and trustworthy so that what you have inside that you want to bring to the other person is able to come across. The essential attitude, the essential quality of, of a leader. And we oftentimes don't develop it in us because we're looking at the bottom line or we're looking at the projects to be, you know, we almost can sometimes have a very macho opinion of ourselves. <laughs> Just to be honest, we can look at a very macho opinion about leaders where we expect, you know, our leaders to be these people that are just, you know, brutal and, you know, and cutthroat and, and move forward. But ask yourself if you really want to follow them. I'm thinking of some companies or organizations where money really is the common denominator, both for the person who's managing and the person who's following. They're all in it for the money. It's almost always a, a sign of ill health. So we all know that money is one thing, but you, you can't replace the, the, the value, even the economic value that comes from the relationships that we form together and the morale that allows us not only to do things, but to do things well. I went recently into a store. It was in Florida. It was a store which really, really focused on the culture of freedom and of faith and of family for all their employees. And I was blown away. You would have thought it was a movie scene. I, I, that's what I kept thinking to myself as I walked around because every single employee was smiling. They were proud of their, of their store. I walked up to a lady and I just said, what, why is this place so different? And the lady said, because here we believe in God. And she smiled at me. And, and it just really, you know, it was very touching and very palpable. Now, obviously, we can't all do that. Although some of you can, you know, if you're in privately owned business, why not work on your culture? But my point in saying it is just that it was so attractive. You knew you wanted to be a part of this. And the people wanted to be a part of it. They wanted, they wanted to work there. They, there was something about that place that fed them at a level deeper than their pocketbook. And obviously, this is what we all want to try to do. I chuckle because I'm even thinking, this is even like what it's like in a marriage. You know, you, your spouse can just be, I'm going here, you know, with things. 
But if the, the other spouse doesn't follow, then you're actually not going anywhere, Buster. <laughs> right? Or and sometimes it's, it, it, it could be the, the wife who herself is just so headstrong and so determined and we have to have everything this way. Everything is organized and everything is in place and you're just here to follow along my little game and you're going to have a demoralized husband. And it, because he's not there just to follow along into what you have preordained to be the best way to go. Neither are you. The two of you have to work constantly, not only at trying to get things done, but at trying to bring the other person into it. And you see, isn't that the same everywhere we go? Isn't it just one of the classic problems of a leader to no, have a vision, to have a passion, to have a plan, but to not have the people? How do I bring people into my passionate plan to accomplish my vision? Well, one of the first things we need to ask ourselves is whether or not it's our people's vision too. It, it, do we, have we done the job to actually link what we want to see done to the hearts and the minds of those who are, are going to accomplish it with us and for us in many cases? Or have we actually just tried to sell something that they don't need because we need to sell it? And I think a lot of times the reason young people, for example, don't follow us into the faith is because they don't see how it impacts their life. They see that we think it's important. They'll respect our opinions about it, but they don't know why they need it. And as long as someone doesn't know why they need something that we're trying to get them to do or to buy, then, then they'll never do it. it. They might do it out of force for a little while, but they won't stick with it in the long haul. Our job as a leader is to align our vision and our passion with the genuine needs of the hearts of those who are around us. This is what we mean by forming communion. Is that it's almost a type of servant leadership, right? I'm not leading so that you will follow. I am leading so that you may follow. The real reason I'm leading is because you need where I'm going. And I'm there in order to help you to achieve where I'm going. I know that that, that, that seems obvious in many ways. And it definitely is the key to every successful sales position out there. But why don't we apply it better in our own life, in our interactions with other people? If we do, we'll discover a secret called communion. And this secret is one of the jewels of our Catholic faith and one of the nicest things that we can bring to our marriages and our professions. Would you like to start your Thursday mornings with a scriptural leadership lesson? Join the St. John Leadership Network, where Father Nathan hosts a 30-minute call at 6.30 a.m. in all four U.S. time zones. To learn more, go to www.stjohnleadershipnetwork.org slash member and join for free today. So wh why do we fail? If we go back over the other classes we've gone over, we fail because of fatalism. We fail because of fog. We fail because of fear of risk. We fail because of fatigue. And we can fail also because we can feel forlorn. What does that mean, feeling forlorn? It, it means that we don't believe in the value of what we have as something that other people want. And this is a very pernicious and very widespread feeling amongst people who try to do great things. Think of uh, mothers who try to stay at home and homeschool their kids. Oh my gosh, it's all great until day one. <laughs> and then and the day, at the end of day one, they're usually like, this is never going to work. It's so much work and it's so hard and no one appreciates it, le least of all the kids, right? And so what does mom say? She says, I'm a failure Nobody else can understand me. I'm never going to make this work. I'm never going to make this work. She just failed in her own mind. And she didn't fail because the thing was hard. Nope, she can do that. She didn't fail because she didn't have a great idea, didn't know where to start. Nope, she knew where to start. She failed because she encountered rejection. She encountered struggle. And she didn't know if she believed enough herself, in herself, to be able to make that thing happen. Teachers that go into school, their first day teaching on the job, <laughs> it might be nice, but by the end of their first semester, I mean, if a teacher can make it through their first year, they can make it through anything, right? But if they don't make it through, most teachers don't last more than their first year because it's just so hard to make that relationship, to discipline that classroom, to lead from a position of a teacher. 
They're, they're, that feeling forlorn, in other words, is that there's no communion. That what I, who I am and what I have to offer is not wanted by my people. And I'll be darned, it's just as applicable in marriages. If you go back and, and look at each other, oftentimes this is what's holding marriages back as well. Is that, you know, I just don't feel loved by you. Well, I don't feel respected by you. It's not that you're not a good person. And it's not that you're not a good leader. It's that the bridge, you see, hasn't been built. Right? We Christians are called to be bridge builders with one another. And we Christian leaders are called to be bridge builders with the, the people who are following us. How can I build an effective relationship? One that really touches the heart so that the way that I lead them is able to, to, to get them to follow authentically. Not in a manipulative way and not in a forced way, but in a way where they give their very best. And you'll know this by whether or not they become better by following. If people are just doing things for us or doing things because they're told, things will get done, but our people won't necessarily grow. The real sign here of whether or not we're leading from the attitude of communion is whether or not the, the people's contribution behind us is actually allowing them to grow, whether they, in fact, are getting something out of it. Right? It's, it's an interesting way of looking at it, but it's absolutely critical. And I think we can understand that if we allow ourselves to feel forlorn, we'll never do that. It's a, almost like a pernicious attack inside of us. Nobody likes me. Everybody hates me. I'm going to go eat some worms, right? That old song. <laughs> That's kind of like how we can feel. And because we feel that way, we exude around us an, a, a, an attitude, a climate that makes people not like us. You see this sometimes with elderly people or older folks who are sick, you know, and, and they're in the hospital and they're just curmudgeons. <laughs> and you say, you're just being a curmudgeon today, right? And why do they do that? Because deep down inside, they're craving for love. They need to be loved, but they don't believe that anyone really loves them. And so they give you every excuse to reject them because once you've rejected them, you've proved their premise that in fact, nobody loves them. It's really hard to put on that smiley face and to continue to go through that environment. And frankly, most of the people that work with us won't do that. But if you, if you continue with that attitude, do you know what else will happen? Nothing, right? Because if you don't have followers, you can't accomplish anything that you want. And so you have to be angry enough, to desire enough to make the changes that you want to see happen, to smile and to be happy and to connect and to spend that time that's hard for you necessarily to do, but to spend that time building that bridge with those who are going to be dedicated to following you. It's like nobody wants to follow a, a, a losing proposition. Everybody wants to be on the winning team. And our job as a leader is to tell people and show people that we actually can win. Well, now you say, well, how do I do that? Because it's so hard for me. I don't feel like they like me. I don't feel like it's going to be successful. I don't know why it's so hard. I don't know why I'm the only one struggling. You know, I feel alone and isolated. I feel like nobody else really sees the vision behind this, but I do. And I don't, therefore something must be wrong with me. And we turn inside and we implode. Just hang on a second. This is, this is where Jesus Christ comes to save us. Jesus Christ is the one who we are working for. The, a wonderful devotion that I want you all to write down and then go and then pray every day. It's called the litany of humility. And here's why. In that litany, in that prayer, we actually ask Jesus to liberate us from all of the ways that the opinions of others are actually dominating our own view of ourselves. I am going to forge the bond of communion. They might not like me, but you know what? I'm going to continue to offer myself to lead them. I'm not doing anything wrong just because people don't like me. And it's not because people are having a hard time with my vision that I should give up on my vision. I respond to Christ and Christ commands me to connect with my, with the people that are following me, with the people that I'm trying to work with. I become humble with respect to my own idea and I become humble with respect to the opinions or the seeming rejection of those who are around me 
because I am attached to Jesus Christ. My love for Christ and my relationship with Christ makes me his servant, which means in the end, it's his work that he's accomplishing anyway. And the more humble that I can become, well, the more steadfast that I can become with respect to the mission he's given me, but also the more open I can become to building those relationships and to, to allowing myself to really serve the people who are following, to connect with them in a deeper way, and to believe in what we're doing as more than something that has to be done because I really think it's important into something that we all get to do together because it is so important. This is the, the beautiful thing. Christ changes our attitude of feeling forlorn by saying to us, it's my love for you that is the basis of everything. My smile upon you. My blessing upon you. I love you and you're in this because of me. Don't forget it. When a person knows that they are loved by Jesus, <laughs> well, then there's, there's nothing that can stop the joyful radiance of their character into the hearts of everyone around them. You might not succeed in everything that you're supposed to do. Or that's fine. But you will, you will succeed in the bigger mission of life, which is the joyful enterprise of the great things that God has given you to accomplish for him and with him. Feeling forlorn is not of God. Feeling forlorn is something that can kill off the beautiful things in your heart. We mustn't allow it. How do we fight against it? We let Jesus love us from the inside. We believe that not only does he love us, but he likes us too. <laughs> and with our eyes fixed on him, humble towards the rest, we move on, moving forward to that great end that we have and leaving a spirit of joy behind us as we go. Dare great things for Christ. Share your feedback with Father Nathan. Send us an email at info at stjohninstitute.org. That's info at stjohninstitute.org. And don't forget to subscribe to premium video content to form, unite, and inspire you at Eagle Eye Pro on our website, eagleeyeministries.org. That's eagleeyeministries.org. 